Let's pray together. Spirit, Holy Spirit, come down and fill our souls. Come down as in the days of old. As we remember that, uh, that first day of Pentecost, you filled believers. You gave them the ability to speak in other languages. You revealed yourself to them and you started the church. And so this morning we ask that you would come and be present with us in that same way, that there would be a, a rushing of wind that would encourage our hearts, encourage our minds to know you and to love you. And so as we look at your scripture this morning, Holy Spirit, enable us to do that. Take away all obstacles. Enable us to hear your voice in these words from scripture. We pray this in your son's holy name. Amen. We're going to look today firstly at uh, Acts chapter 2, the first four verses. Luke writes, When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. And then uh, from Paul's letter to the Colossians, our sermon text this morning is Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. Hear the word of God. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Teach and admonish one another in all wisdom and with gratitude in your hearts. Sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to God. The word of the Lord. So there are uh, many moments in the New Testament where we are given what we call these one another commands. And we've been looking at them lately because we want to have great relationships. We want to be in community with each other in a way that is Christian and unique. And we want to have healthy relationships in our family and with other people. And we do that by following these one another commands in the New Testament. And in our Colossians text this morning, we have teach one another. Now we know, of course, that teaching one another has always been a part of Christian communities. Jesus was a teacher for sure, right? He said, you call me teacher and you're right because that is what I am. Paul and Timothy were certainly teaching all over the place. On the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit is a teacher. Tongues of fire appear. And the believers are, are given this ability to speak in different languages. So teaching has always been an essential activity in Christian communities. Now, we've just, uh, many of you know, finished a little survey that we've done in the congregation. It's part of a larger discussion that the elders are having. They're talking about how they can bring greater clarity to our mission. And uh, wow, let me tell you, that uh, survey has been really helpful already. Uh, the highlights, uh, uh, the results shed some, some light on some really important things, and we'll share those with you, of course, very soon. Uh, but I want to say thanks, uh, certainly, to everyone who participated in the survey. We actually had uh, a great participation rate. We had 50% more people than we felt like we needed to get good results, so that was, that was really exciting. But I do want to share one thing from the survey with you right now. In the survey, can you guess what the most important ministry was. Out of all of the ministries that many of you indicated were important, the most important out of all of them was teaching and preaching. Preaching, of course, is a, a form of teaching, and, uh, and that was high, but all of the categories of teaching and preaching, like teaching children and teaching youth and, and teaching adults, they all scored the highest on the survey before everything else. There's just something so basic about, the, about teaching in the Christian life. It's clearly an act of discipleship to others, and, and, and learning is an act of discipleship too. And so Paul writes in our text, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Teach 
and admonish one another in all wisdom. When I was in college, I took a uh, class. It was called Reasons for Faith. It was an apologetics course. And on the first day of the class, there was this student there, and he started arguing with the professor. He was super inappropriate. And after a while, a bunch of other students kind of joined in, and the whole class just started arguing, and some people raised their voice. Now, this sort of thing just didn't happen very much at Whitworth. It still doesn't happen at, at Whitworth. But on that day, it did. And the argument got really out of hand. But the whole time, I just sat there. I never got involved. I just sat back because I knew that the guy who started the argument was a plant. It was a fake, right? A fake argument. I've always been this kind of skeptical sort of person. And sure enough, it turned out that the professor had invited his friend to come and start this argument on, on purpose. It was a teaching method, of course. There are so many ways to teach, and there are so many ways to learn. We, we often just think of lectures, maybe, or books, but, but my professor started a fight, and we learned. There are lots of ways to teach. And so Paul, in our one verse today, says that we teach with gratitude. He mentions teaching through psalms and teaching through hymns and teaching through spiritual songs. This is part of the reason we sing in worship. He connects teaching also to admonishment. And certainly he's teaching as he's, he's writing the letter right then. He doesn't have just, just preaching in mind, but we know that uh, from his other letters that that is certainly part of it. There are lots of ways to teach, lots of ways to learn. Maybe you learn, maybe we learn through sermons. Maybe we learn in our small groups or through Bible studies. Maybe we learn in Sunday school. Vacation Bible school, of course, is coming up. And our children's minister, Joe, needs your help with that. It's a great opportunity to be a part of teaching, even if you're not the teacher, even if you're serving snacks or, or doing some music or whatever. It can all be part of teaching. So sign up for that. You can read about it in the bulletin. But maybe some of you teach through your actions, or maybe you, you teach in your relationships, you know, sort of modeling the, the Christian life. In this uh, verse, though, Paul definitely gives a shout-out specifically to music. Songs teach us. Susan Asplund's not here today, but she's our organist and she's our pianist, but she's more than that, too. She's also our teacher. Today, we're learning through jazz, a really unique thing for us and a neat way to learn. I love it. It's great. So this is a big part, right, of Christian community. We teach one another. And Paul affirms in this verse that there are, as I've said, lots of ways to teach, but he also says that there is only one thing to teach. Paul's got this really broad view here of what teaching can look like, but he's got this laser focus about what the teaching is about. And so there's lots of ways to teach, but in Colossians, there is only one thing to teach. Paul is very specific about that. When we read the, the context, <clears throat> we know that Paul is talking about Jesus only. This isn't the first time that he, he mentions wisdom in, in Colossians. And when he does that, that word stands in opposition to people in the church who were actually not teaching Jesus. And so Paul here is specifically and only talking about the gospel. It's the word of Christ that we teach. We get uh, sidetracked sometimes, and if we do, if we get sidetracked teaching other things, like maybe popular ideas or life skills, or maybe we teach about felt needs or, or something like that, then it always needs to be connected clearly to the gospel, or it's got to grow out of the gospel. Jesus came and he died for you, and he rose for you to save you, to give you a new life, to bring you close to God. That is what we teach. So you should hear the gospel every single Sunday, without fail, every, every single one. It's part of why I give the same benediction most Sundays, because it's the gospel. 
I always kind of figure if, if something goes horribly wrong in the worship service, I don't know, you know what that would be, but if it did, then at least we will end with a clear gospel statement. The gospel will be taught. And so Paul follows up this one verse with another verse, and he says, whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of, and I bet you can finish it, in the name of who? Jesus, right? Paul says, do everything in the name of Jesus. Your teaching, my teaching, uh, the relationships that we have, the learning that we do, that is all in the name of Jesus. That is who we teach. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. We get to hear this morning from a couple of the students we've just met a moment ago. Uh, we're going to hear from them. They're seniors. They've been part of the youth ministry for a long time. And they're going to share a little of their testimony with us. They're going to share specifically what the, the teaching at Hamblin Church has, uh, how the teaching at Hamblin Church has brought them close to Jesus Christ over their years. So we're going to hear from Gracie Teeple and Summer Reed. So come on up. And I will adjust this for you. Thanks, you two. I've learned a lot during confirmation classes, content times at youth group, and in sermons on Sunday mornings at Hamblin. But being involved in the Hamblin community is where I began understanding a lot of the most important aspects of my faith. The congreg this congregation truly embodies the idea of living like Jesus. Although I can think of a lot of examples of how the congregation does this, Vacation Bible School stands out in my mind. Having been a participant a long time ago and later a volunteer, it's really inspiring to see everyone come together in generous service to put on a week full of fun and important ministry. No matter how much time needs to be spent planning or how crazy the week gets, everyone remains gracious, devoted, and passionate each day. Every year, VBS gives me a glimpse of what Jesus' Jesus's life must have looked like in action, and this glimpse, along with the others that I've experienced through Hamblin, are invaluable in helping me understand who Jesus is. Getting to know Christ in the example of Hamblin's community is an instrumental part of my faith journey. The love and support that Hamblin and its members show me are powerful reminders of Jesus' commitment to all of God's children. This example of living with purpose, being kind, and rejoicing in God through both good times and bad ones has shown me how the love of Christ can be demonstrated in the world and has brought me closer to Jesus. Hamblin has been a part of my life since I was born. I was baptized here and grew up attending all the programs that were available to me, available to me at every age. Fish, kick, confirmation, and now I just finished up in Oasis. My faith was founded here at Hamblin, having learned Bible stories and lessons in Sunday school that introduced me to the idea of God and is essentially the basis for everything I know about Christianity now. Since then, I have grown and matured as a follower of Christ, largely because of this wonderful church community who has supported me in my faith journey along the way. I have always felt loved and cared for by this congregation, being stopped after services to share updates on my recent events or to give hugs. It is because of this love and support that I see God in our church and each of our members, which has fostered my growth in faith and my relationship with Jesus. I have seen how God works through and uses our pastors, our members, and our children to do such amazing things like sending so many of our youth to Camp Spaulding, in my opinion, one of the best places for growth in Christ, giving opportunities for mission trips to Oklahoma, Ganado, and this year Washington, D.C., and through supporting our youth programs here so that us youth feel welcome and part of the church as a whole. Having these wonderful experiences at Hamblin has brought me closer to God, and without the help of Hamblin, I would not have had some of the opportunities that I've gotten to be involved in throughout my high school career. I've been a youth deacon, I've uh, got to go to Oklahoma for disaster relief, um, and I really got to meet some of my best role models. Being a member here has really made me realize how much I'm going to miss this community next year, and in college, it's my goal to find a local church that has such a welcoming congregation and love for God because Hamblin has provided me with such a great foundation for, in my relationship with Jesus, and I want to keep developing that throughout my life. <laughs> 